All right. So welcome everybody to our EMS week, uh, day one, the future is female. And with me, I have two of our esteemed board members. I have the president of the Savic Buying Group board, Ruby Mayer, and I also have one of our other esteemed board members, Terry Hamilton. Um, do you, Terry, would you like to start and introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Terry Hamilton. I live in South Carolina now. I uh, transplanted from New York. I got my start in EMS in New York after my parents both spent a huge amount of time in the local volunteer ambulance corps where I lived in New York. Um, I lived in Rockland County. It's about 30 miles north of New York City. And um, I've done my deed in New York, and now I'm here to terrorize South Carolina. Excellent. South Carolina is lucky to have you. Uh, Ruby, what about you? My name is Ruby Mayer, and I am uh, live in Missouri. Um, became associated with SAVIC in 2016, and it's been a really interesting part of our EMS journey. I, have, I started in 1974 when I became an EMT, and then in 76, I became a paramedic, and I began to look for jobs and... Um, found some barriers there. So we can talk about some of those, but I, most of my career has been as a flight nurse and um, I've been really fortunate to have a lot of other doors open for me. So while there were some barrier, barriers in the beginning, um, now it's completely different than it was when we started. Well, good that you bring it up. Um, I was going to ask the next question I was going to ask is how did you guys get the start in EMS? What what kind of called you to the vocation here? Um, but I think both of you kind of answered it for the most part. Um, but what was it like back then when you were trying to, when you were kind of emerging into the industry at the beginning of your careers? What was what was EMS like at that point? Go ahead, Ruby. All right, I'll go first. EMS was in its infancy, really, when I started in 1974, and I knew then when I got out of that brief schooling that I wasn't ready to pick up people off the road. So I went to a hospital and worked for a couple of years, and during that time, um, I was invited to attend a paramedic class, which um, Dr. Mitchell, Dr. Frank Mitchell here in Missouri is a very famous person, trauma surgeon. And he was the one that kind of um, got this whole program going for paramedics and EMTs. And he was my paramedic instructor. So when I got finished with that, I had spent a couple of years in ICU as a nurse's assistant, and I felt like I was ready. So I started to look for jobs right after I finished the paramedic schooling. I moved back to the Kansas City area, and I started looking for jobs right after I got here because I was newly licensed and ready to go. And I did meet um, a lot of different people with a lot of different no's. Most of the reasons I think it was not just that I was a woman, but I was a small woman and they didn't think that I could handle the job. And after I was going around uh, for the second time to some of the same places again, seeing if they had any openings, um, a lady kind of leaned across the desk and said to me a little quietly, honey, they ain't never going to hire you. you. You're not going to be allowed to sleep here. And I thought, I hadn't even thought of that. I didn't think that I had any kind of barrier like that. But I gave up then and I thought, okay, if that's what it is. And, I, and, and it was also not compatible with having small children. And I had three children at that point that were not very big. And they were 24-hour shifts that they were on, uh, offering um, where I could get a job. Um, and I, so I kept looking for something that was more compatible, couldn't find anything. So I went back to school to become a nurse. And, um, that was about the time I started nursing school in 77, the helicopter arrived in Kansas city in 1978, the fifth air ambulance in the United States. It was, uh, based at a hospital. And I thought being small might be a good thing. And, <laughs> but it would put me back in the pre-hospital setting and that's where I wanted to be. So that was my goal. And I did achieve it several years later. That's fantastic. Um, Terry, what about you? What are your uh, what are your early beginnings? So I started with my local volunteer ambulance corps, Havistar Ambulance in Rockland County. I was the one of the first youth squad members of their agency. Um, I joined in 1974, very much like Ruby. Um, so I 
kind of started on the ground. I started as a youth squad member and worked my way up. Uh, both of my parents were very involved in the ambulance corps. So I grew up surrounded by the field, um, spent a lot of time there on the weekends uh, at the building. Um, that was always the big, the fun part of the weekend. Hey, let's go to the building. You know, um, so I was, it was either fit in or sit in the corner and whine and complain and cry that I was bored and had nothing to do. So at 13, I decided I'm going to fit in. Um, and I did. So uh, I'm fortunate to say that I had I had a lot of a lot of strong individuals that guided me. They took me under their wing. They wanted me to be there. Um, I didn't face I really didn't face troubles or trying situations as a youth squad member. Um, it was a little difficult in school because I was the EMS geek and I wasn't you know getting involved in band or you know clubs at school. My club was at home. I got to ride the ambulance, you know. Um, <laughs> I it was that was my club, you know. <laughs> um, so it was it was awesome, you know. Um, and like I said, I I don't. I don't really think I had many um many obstacles. It was it was really awesome. They they took the youth squad in and welcomed us with open arms and I it became me. It was, you know, it was it was it's the calling. You know, it, it's it's not something that you just say, gee, I think I'm gonna join the ambulance corps. It's like I want to be on the ambulance, you know, <laughs> yeah, with the lights, the sirens, all that. Oh, yeah. And it, until it, you get until you get that first call when somebody, you know, pardon me for saying, but until somebody throws up on you and you're like, ew, what am I doing? You know, but that's um it's the calling. Oh yeah. The uh the the brown champagne of uh christening a new EMT is always yep. the best part. <laughs> but um I I now that we've kind of we kind of covered the early career, but like what are some career highlights that you ladies have? What are some of the kind of some more girl powery moments that you have? And I actually have one from my career. I remember I was doing a transport. It was inner facility and it was a very large patient that we were taking from a hospital into a psychiatric hospital. And it was not a particularly hard drive. It was not a long transport, but there was security at the at the receipt at the uh, sending facility. And they looked at me and my female partner and they said, oh, you can't take that patient. You absolutely you know, you can't bring him restrained. Right. And we had this kind of moment where we looked at each other and we said, no, we've got this. And of course, we pulled it off. We took him perfectly fine. There was no issues with that. Um, but there are a lot of patients that we've had where people are like, oh, you can't lift that. You're too small. Or this isn't what ladies should be doing. Like I've had so many of those in my career and my career was very short, especially compared to yours. What are some of your kind of girl power career moments? Those little look at me, I am woman, hear me roar. I don't know that I had one that really made me roar, but there was one that really um, made me know I was doing the right thing. And it came very early. It was actually, I remember it distinctly. It was February 14th, 1985. I had only been flying for about a month. And um, I went out to a, a small rural hospital and picked up a person, a little old gentleman that was um, in heart failure. And, and um, he was in pretty tough shape. So we loaded him up and started back to the Kansas City Hospital where we were based. And um, in the process, uh, I gave him some medication that was for his blood pressure because it kept just, just circling the drain. And one of the side effects of that blood pressure medicine was to make people throw up, which he promptly did. <laughs> and in the emergency department, I was an expert at dodging. And so I dodged. <laughs> Only I was in a helicopter and I was kind of like, oh, there's no place to go. And so um, the reason I remember the dates, because my then fiance, now husband, um, it was his birthday in addition to being Valentine's Day. And we had plans that evening. And so I come in the hospital with his supper all over me and <laughs> uh, in my hair, you know, everything, every place. And I got him to the intensive care unit. And then um, the thing that was, that warmed my heart so was about two weeks later, he and his little wife walked out of the hospital and on their way home. And I knew then there was a reason for that helicopter and a reason for the crew that we'd put together. And 
And there was a reason for us to go out and help people. And it didn't matter what happened to us. And it didn't matter that I missed our Valentine's dinner and all that stuff. Cause I didn't get home till almost midnight, but um, it was, it made me know that it was worthwhile. What we were doing was good, good for, for the, the industry, for people. It, we said we were saving lives and, and it became an identity then, just like Terry said, it wasn't just a job. It was who I, who I was, my identity, uh, who I, you know, I, it was what I embraced and it was my life. It was more than the job. Yeah, it's so awesome. Powerful. It Terry, what do you got? Um, Mine was a, not so much an aha moment, but a, a moment that kind of stayed with me for a very long time. Uh, we got called for a party in labor and uh, we went down to the house, we picked her up and, you know, the cop was like, oh, get her in the ambulance, get her in the ambulance. Because, you know, cops <laughs> don't want to deal with that. They don't want to see women's body parts, yeah. you know, they don't want to see women's not coming out. Yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> so we loaded her up in the ambulance and, you know, I said, all right, before we go, I just want to do a quick exam. I just want to take a look and see where we're at and whatnot. And we were doing good. Everything was fine. She was having contractions. They were really close. We knew this was going to happen. It's her first baby. So I'm like, eh, we got time. So we're driving and uh, there's a spot in in my cover in my coverage area. It's called the Lookout, and it's a spot on Route 9W in Havistraw, and it overlooks the Hudson River. And um, it was a makeout spot. It was it was a place where you know everybody <laughs> went. They parked their cars. They made out. And so we're driving, and all of a sudden she's she's pushing, and and I looked and and I see the baby's head coming. I'm like, pull over now. And they're like, no. I said, no, pull over now. So we pulled over at the lookout, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> we delivered this absolutely amazing, healthy baby girl uh, oh. at the lookout. And like hours later, we were, we were reflecting on it and we were laughing. I said, I wonder how many babies were actually conceived in the lookout. <laughs> and we actually <laughs> delivered one there, you know? So, and the cool part about it was um, they, the, the family reached out to the ambulance corps to find out who was on the call and who delivered the baby. And um, her name is Teresita. <laughs> they oh. named her after me. So it was pretty cool. You know, it was cool to be able to do that. And, you know, the cord cutting and all of that stuff, it was, it was just a great, it was a great experience and it kind of made you feel like okay this is what I want to do um mm -hmm. fast forward in my my EMS career it was a really really bad snowy night and we got called to a local senior citizen place and it was for a 101 year old lady who had pain in her chest it wasn't chest pain mm -hmm. it was a pain in her chest we loaded her up in the ambulance. We're taking her to the hospital. She reached over. She grabbed my hand. She was holding my hand. And we were talking on the way to the hospital. And this was this was my aha moment. She looked at me and she said, you know, I think God forgot about me. And I said, what do you mean? She says, I'm 101 years old. All of my friends are gone and I'm still here. I think God forgot about me. And I smiled. I looked at her. I said, I don't think God forgot about you. I think God realizes that you have so much more to give to us still. Brought her to the hospital, gave them my business card and said, when she's ready to go home, you call me and my ambulance will bring her back home. Just to know that there's, she talked about so many life events that, you know, I never would have even thought about. Here she is 101 years old. She was lonely. She needed somebody to talk to on a snowy, crappy night. And I was that person. And so many people don't understand that it's, it's, yeah, the, it, it's the blood, it's the guts, it's the gore, it's the lights, it's the sirens. For me, it's a little old lady who needs their hand held. Oh yeah. I've, I've had my fair share of those too. I honestly, both so powerful of stories, but to kind of pivot from the patient ends and the, and the back to the industry style, what changes have you seen in EMS throughout your kind of tenure? What have you seen that has evolved for women throughout the courses of your career? Like how, how are we different now than we were back when you started? Well, that's kind of a hard question in a way, because um, some of our experiences that I think we've all had in the past um, have been kind of initiation rights to get into the industry. And, and when you go to the fire station and uh, you have to spend some time there, um, there's, there are a lot of things that go on that you, in the, in the early times, I don't know if it goes on now. I don't think that it does, but what I found 
was while there were a lot of um, almost rejections or tests or whatever to see if you were made strongly enough to take not just the physical part, but the emotional and the mental part that went on with the job. And, and I know that with me, that was completely different a few years later when I was flying and um, there was a respect and there was helpfulness and there is a, let me help you take care of this. I mean, it was like they were protecting us and um, making sure that things were taken care of for us to put the person in the helicopter, et cetera. So at, at the first, it was kind of a hostile environment, but as I, as things turned, um, it became a very warm and accepting and helpful environment, at least for me. So that's probably one of the biggest changes, but I can't give you an exact identifier. It was a gradual thing. That's still awesome to hear. Uh, Terry, what about you? What do you, uh, what do see, you see? I kind, I kind of mirror Ruby in that I've watched EMS come from the boys club to women being chiefs of their agencies and, yes. and everyone becoming an equal. Um, I believe once a woman's handled her first stretcher lift, um, that's way before power stretchers for those of you that don't realize that, you know, we actually had to lift the stretcher with the patient on it. <laughs> um, power stretchers became a luxury. Oh, yeah. We um, had, a, we had manual stretchers too, back when I was yeah. uh, starting my agency to not upgrade all of them. Manual stair chair too. Now they got the fancy ones. Absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, I think once that all happened, um, they were accepted and as, as being able to hold their own, um, Women, in my opinion, have uh, proven the ability to grow, to strive, to keep up with the demands, you know, lifting, restraining, driving. You know, how many how many people are like, oh, I'm not going to let a woman drive my ambulance or where she's going to drive the ambulance. Oh, I'm not getting in there to it, it's totally acceptable now. I said, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it's it's I think women have gotten out there and proved who we are, you know. I, I look at Ruby's structure and Ruby's a little person. And I'll be honest with you, it, it's not just, it's just not her size, but I don't think I would want to be the person to tangle with Ruby. You know, it's like, <laughs> I think Ruby could throw down one of the best of them, you know? I think both of you could throw down one of the best of them. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I think it was really divine intervention that I didn't get a job as a paramedic or as an EMT because... I wasn't prepared. I really didn't know what I didn't know. And and I also think that with Terry talking about lifting and all, I think I would have torn my body up a long time ago if I had done that and been in it because we didn't have power this or power that or anything. It was all you did it you know pretty much with your muscle. And so probably it was very much divine intervention that I manual was sent CPR. Back to <laughs> you remember doing oh, manual CPR? I could do CPR. We did not CPR have easy. CPR is easy in the helicopter because you can brace yourself against the, the roof. <laughs> well, so I'll go back. I'll go back that far too. CPR and the Cadillac ambulances were easy because you could straddle the stretcher <laughs> and brace your back on the roof of the truck. You know, Ruby, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> no, I never got, I never got quite that far. I never got to actually do patient care inside of anything as an we EMT had or paramedic. Ambulances. While I had the licenses, I didn't practice <laughs> So you have many more experiences than I did, Terry. <laughs> yeah, we have we had the ambulances with the uh, with the curved walls. You can kind of brace out. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so it's a lot of the struggles are still there. But um, how do you think EMS is evolving, kind of in the future? What do you see? What do you see happening for women in the industry, just as the industry kind of evolves? I think that part of what Terry already said, women are already moving into the fire chief's positions. Uh, you see them in um, being the police chief. I mean, in every industry, we have females that are leaders. And hopefully the reason they're the leaders because they were the best person for the job, not because they were male or female or anything else, except they were the best people, had the best qualities, and they they strive to succeed. So they, they were rewarded with their position. So I see nothing but good for women in, in the future. And you know, community paramedics or mobile integrated health is, is so much on the horizon of our future. And I think that's perfect for women. 
I don't know how the other women are going to feel about it, but if I were still going to be practicing, I would definitely probably become a um, community paramedic or a mobile integrated health medic because you go into people's homes and you interact with them and you talk to them and and like Terry said, you touch them and it's all the things that you want to do to be nurturing and to be helpful and to guide people and make, make them independent, et cetera. And then you can go home at the end of the day and you don't have to get up in the middle of the night when the tones go off and you have weekends off most of the time. And uh, it's just perfect for women, especially women with families that want to be able to watch their kids play football that night or baseball or whatever they're doing. So I, sure. I think that it's That's absolutely wide open. Yeah. You know, I see the um, the future of EMS um, and women in EMS in particular is that the advantages we don't I don't think women have anything to prove anymore. I think we've we've gotten out there. We've shown people that we're able to do this. This is what we want to do. Um, we've got people that we have people that want to make this a career and we've got people that want to be able to give back to their community. And I think it's it's a great combination and a great mix for the the mom whose kids are now the empty nest syndrome, you know, her kids are now able to take care of themselves and she's spent all this time taking care of her kids. And now she wants to do something to make herself feel, continue to feel good, you know? So how can I give back to my community? Can I work this around my kid's school schedule? Um, I can get up in the morning, do the things that I feel I have to do and I need to do for my family. And now I can get back to my community. So there's, there's the woman that, wants to give back to her community, doesn't want to make it a career, but wants to be able to give back and show her capabilities. And then there's the woman that all the kids are out of this out of the house now and I want to do something. I, so I'm going to become an EMT and I'm going to become a paramedic and and I'm going to give what I have and I'm going to make it a career now. So now here's the career that I've given up to raise my family and now I'm going to raise me. I love that. That's a great sentiment. I think that I think that there's a lot of growth for women in the future, but I think that you ladies have kind of pioneered. Women have pro proven their mettle time and time again, and we're slowly but surely infiltrating the boys clubs. <laughs> but as it goes on, I want to know what advice do you kind of have for women that are in their profession? Maybe they're just starting, maybe they're kind of growing their growing themselves out, or maybe just something that you have that you would have told yourself when you started, like when you began your career, what advice do you have? To be genuine, to be um, prepare yourself so that you're competent so that you're giving the right care, so that you can be confident as you provide that care to your patient. Don't be afraid to touch them and uh, be compassionate. And if you're that, then you can take care of people and um, everything else will unfold for you. And you just you just have to go in and be the best person you can be and do the best job you can do can do and go home at night and and be satisfied that that's what you've done and that the hard part for me is um remembering the the calls that didn't go well and those are the ones that stick with us and so it's used to be when we first started it was kind of a sign of weakness if you went for help or some kind of stigma and that's not the way it is anymore and it is a tough job it it is something that sometimes you need some help with here and there, and it should be okay. You need to talk to other people that do the same kind of job that you do because they understand what you do. It's really hard to talk sometimes to your your spouse or your family member that doesn't live that world. So just um, know that going into this profession, you become part of the job. You can become you identify with it, um, and hopefully what you'll be doing is is saving lives about maybe 5% of the time and the rest of the time you're going to be comforting and just caring for people and being compassionate and competent awesome me um 
I would, I would recommend don't ever let anyone intimidate you. Maintain your confidence, trust yourself, and always remember why you chose EMS. Because you, you did, you chose it. You made the decision to do that. Um, and if I had the opportunity to tell myself anything, the younger me, um, don't allow anyone to tell you when to reach for the stars. You hold the key to your future, go out and unlock doors. Wow. Well, ladies, yeah. legends, thank you so much for talking to us. Your careers have spoken for themselves, but it's just really awesome to speak to you about just all of it. Like I could listen to you guys for the rest of the day, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> You'd be but, tired, uh, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know that I would. Honestly, <laughs> I genuinely love the stories that you guys come up with. And also just, it's 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 nice to have, like, you guys are legends, you're icons. I, I think if women are looking up to figures in the community, you are two powerhouses of, of, of EMS greatness. Just looking at your reputations that have preceded you and where you even are to this day, having stuck with it, you possess a medal that I don't know that I ever could. So ladies, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you immensely. Thank you for your kindness. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you.